Hello, and welcome to The Writing Forge, where we discuss tips and tricks for honing your writing. I'm Bonnie. I'm Miranda. And we're your hosts. Let's Let's get get into into it. it. Well, welcome to The Writing Forge, everyone. I am Bonnie. I'm Miranda. And we have Amy Rivers with us today. And we are going to eventually talk about writing trauma. But before then, Amy, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, heavens. Um, Hi, I'm Amy Rivers. I'm the director of Northern Colorado Writers and an author. I indie publish, so I have four novels out right now, plus a bunch of short stories and personal essays. And last year, two years ago, uh, my book, All the Broken People, won the Colorado Author Project Award. And then as a result of that, I won Indie Author of the Year in 2021 uh, by the Indie Author Project. So it's like my little writer-y Miss America <laughs> stint. So. so how did you get to be a writer? I used to love to write, but when I was in third grade, um, our elementary school did a program called the Melton Book Program, and we got to actually write stories and then do all of the things to bring them about into book productions. So my mom had to type up the things on a typewriter, and I had to illustrate them, and we had to glue them to pages and sew them together and give them binding, and it was a super fun project. And, of course, all the rest of the kids were writing, like, stories about puppies and things like that because we were, you know, in third grade. We were, like, nine. And I wrote a romance novel because that's me. <laughs> and so it was called Cindy Never Thought, and that's with C-Y-N-D-I, which made it very edgy. Mm-hmm. And she, at some point, ended up... Um, you know, foiling this whole plot to get in between her and her love. And then they got married in a multicolored wedding dress. And it was nice. sort of the thing that got me down (laughs) this path. And I never really stopped writing. Now I need (laughs) to publish that book. Do you have it? I do have it. And it is a very fun thing that people like to bring out, especially my parents during family (laughs) gatherings. And then we all laugh really, really hard. And it's all at my expense. But it's all in good fun, right? I'm laughing with them, so I suppose that counts. (laughs) As As long long as as you're laughing with them. Uh, And now for the topic that is unfortunately a little less fun, but still (laughs) very important to talk about is trauma. Um, Your latest book series, because I think that's the easiest to hop off of. What what is the title of the series? I know the first one is called Complicit. Oh, it's a Legacy of Silence, right? Yes. Um, So this whole series will be a legacy of silence. There are three books planned right now, maybe more than that. Although now that I'm ending book two and getting on to book three, I'm having a few other ideas that I want to chase down. So yes, a legacy of silence. And I'm working on book two in the series, which will come out this September. And it deals with a lot of sexual assault, if I remember correctly. And so how, how do you write trauma and how do you approach it respectfully. As in a former life, I worked as the director for a sexual assault nurse examiners program in New Mexico and also studied. um, I did my master's degree in was sort of an interdisciplinary thing. And one of the things I focused on was violence prevention. And so being able to actually do community education and to talk about really hard topics like sexual assault and domestic violence in a way that didn't make people immediately cringe and shut down was sort of part of my job. Mm -hmm. Um, I would do talks or do programs, that sort of thing. I did um, school health fairs where I had to talk to little kids and figure out what was age appropriate and what would actually make the most impact on them. And so I got pretty good at having that conversation without it feeling so heavy and dark and Mm -hmm. terrible. But of course, when you're writing about anything trauma related, you also have to think about what kind of triggers, you know, you're going to be putting out there and how people are going to respond who have been victimized in that way. So when I'm writing, um, what I'm really trying to do is find a balance between having enough of the emotional impact of the actual trauma on the page without getting gratuitous about it, without being graphic or too graphic in a way that will that kind of makes it more about entertainment and less about what's really happening. Because Mm -hmm. ultimately my goal in life is to write stories where people can see how trauma affects other people and then be able to have more empathy for them. I feel like that is one of the major 
goals of reading in general is just to, to gain empathy for people. I think that's one of the things that you get from reading, getting into other people's lives. That's why I think is reading is so important as a kid, too, because you're like, oh, there are other people that have feelings. and Right. Mm-hmm. And, and just in general, I think, you know, being able to be inside someone else's head for a little while and hear their story sort of through their through their eyes and through their ears to be able to kind of experience that. I agree. I think it's really important in understanding what other people are like and what their lives are like. And for me, when I'm writing especially about violence, um, that kind of trauma, I'm really seeking to build some understanding about the fact that victims do not all react the same way to violence yeah. and to mm-hmm. trauma. Um, there are lots, there's a you know as many ways to react to that stuff as there are people in the world. And so one of the other things that I think is really important is just being able to help people understand that human beings are unique and they have different responses and some of them are more resilient than others. And a lot of that has to do with their personality and who they are, but a lot of it also has to do with the kind of support they have, uh, that sort of thing. Have you ever written about your own trauma? Like we all, we all have our things in our lives. And so is that something that you've ever addressed or is that something that you, um, that you avoid? I know, (laughs) I know there are some people that avoid writing about their own stuff, but I also know a lot of people who use writing as therapy. And so is that something like... They do say write what you know, so... Write what you... (laughs) They do say write what you know. And I think that, you know, we all, we all do that on some level. There's only one perspective that you really can have and you can try and build up understanding about other people, but we're all sort of writing from our own lens, you know, Mm. and and from our own perspective and worldview and backstory and all of those things. So we can only really write as we are. For me, um, I do write about things that I've experienced, um, but I also write about things that other people have experienced or that I've seen happening around me. Mm. And I will say that, um, you know, I don't want to make it sound like every single story or every single person has to have trauma. Yeah. But I think that we've all experienced some sort of trauma. You know, mm-hmm. we've lost people that we loved or, you know, we've gotten in a car accident or whatever it happens lived to be. Lived through a global pandemic. Yes. yes. I, I think right now, especially, <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, communal trauma that we're sort of trying to work our way through right now. And so it's not that unrelatable. And sometimes I think drawing those parallels is really important for people too. You know, it's the trauma that you might have experienced in that car accident may feel very similar to what another person experienced getting in a fight with somebody. And even though they're two different things, sometimes our body processes that in really similar ways. Mm. And so how do you find that? How do you find that line? How do you, is it I assume it's different for every author and every and every reader, but how do you find the line between being, like you were saying earlier, being too graphic or being too gratuitous or, or getting too, I guess, deep into the emotion? I know what I try to do. I won't speak for other people. I know what I try to do is I try to be as true to the situation as possible without – Without trying to force other people to live through it exactly as I have lived through it or as other people have lived through it. So I try to get close to it, but not, but eventually like fade to black, like how they talk about in romance. I was saying is I feel like there is a certain amount of like imagination is a thing. So you can definitely Mm -hmm. leave some things open for imagination. Well, and the way that people are going to relate to it is based on how they are taking it in. So I think sometimes if you spell everything out too clearly, you're sort of trying to dictate the way in which people are going to interpret or the way that things are going to resonate with them. And I think that that just makes it that much less authentic. And whatever you're trying to achieve at that point becomes so much less genuine than it would be otherwise. So Hmm. for me, I'm always thinking, and especially when I get to revision parts, you know, I'm a total pantser when I write. So for those of you who don't know what that is, I basically word vomit my entire <laughs> book out. It's a brute force effort. And I already know when I get started that it's going to suck after the first <laughs> draft and that I'm going to have to do a lot of work in revision. And so when I'm working on revision, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, what what is the purpose of having this scene here? Why is it important for this scene to feel a little bit more intense than this one? Or, you know, is it really necessary to keep people on edge that whole entire time in this way? Is there a way to soften this that makes it feel a little bit less horrifying? Although, you know, a lot of what I write about 
it's, it's horrible. And, mm. you know, sometimes it's very hard, I think, to relate if we haven't been through that ourselves or if we don't know somebody who is. But even for those people, I feel like if you pick up the book, have an experience with it, and then maybe someday if you meet somebody who's had that kind of trauma, you have a little bit of a better idea of how to react to them and how to support them, um, then I've kind of done my job. Mm. Um, I want people to be entertained too, obviously. And I love to read a good serial killer book. I mean, <laughs> the bloodier, the better. I'm not going to lie. I love a good horror story. But my goal as a writer is to really look at trauma authentically mm -hmm. and to try and help people relate to it better. And so I'm not interested in having those gory scenes. What I'm interested in is really giving people a very visceral feel for what it might be like mm -hmm. to be in that situation without actually traumatizing them while I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Definitely. And then how how about the healing process? And so I think, I don't know, it, I personally, as a reader, look for books that like, okay, if you're going to put me through these terrible situations, <laughs> like, please, for the love of God, give me something, you know, give me some healing along the way. Um, and there's been a couple of books that I've read that like, you know, two chapters later, all of a sudden everything is magically better. And I'm like, I'm not better. <laughs> like, no, this, this, this doesn't work. And so how, how do you approach things like recovering from trauma or reacting to trauma? Cause not everyone gets to heal by the end of the book and that's fair and okay. But I still feel like, you know, readers need like at least a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Well, and that's that's a great question because I think that the answer really for me is um, not everybody heals by the end of a book because that is not realistic. No, you know, not we, at all. <laughs> our lives are not wrapped up in pretty packages like that ever. And so I feel like that's definitely not something you're going to see if you're reading my books. But I do believe in hope. I think that there's always hope. Um, I am a hopeful person. I am a very optimistic person. And so I believe that there is something out there, whether it's support, your family, um, some hobby or activity, whatever it happens to be that kind of pulls you out of some of the horrible things that are happening to you provides hope. It provides you with a, a view of the world that is not mired down in the horrible things that are happening in your life at that particular moment. So I believe in hope and I'm also a hopeless romantic <laughs> um, as probably demonstrated through writing a romance novel when I was in third grade. <laughs> um, I love romance. I love to read bloody gory books and I also love when people fall in love. So, and I'm not afraid to mix those two things. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, relationships are where I'm looking for that hope too, whether mm -hmm. it's a broken relationship that's becoming better or mm -hmm. that there's some sign that at least you can come back from that or love. I love love. <laughs> um, I'm like horrible thing happens, but also there's love. And so, you know, and sometimes that's what you need to get through. Sometimes it is that kind of a, a thing that helps you to overcome whatever has been happening. My husband says that all I write is relationship books. <laughs> <laughs> they could be crime fiction. They could be romance. They could be whatever, but they're all relationship books. And that's absolutely true because I am really focused on relationships and how people are in relationship with one another under stress and, you know, during difficult times. I, you made me think of my favorite fantasy series is The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. And one of the things that I love about it is that almost all of the main characters have some kind of trauma of a different kind or or they're dealing with a mental illness or, or things like that. And and I'm thinking because, you know, one character will get to the end of, the, of a book and have made some huge revelations about their own mindset and stuff, and then they get to the next book and they fall in a different pitfall of kind of the same thing. And in some ways it's a little frustrating because it's like, look, you made so much progress there. But like on the one hand, uh, like that is realistic. Like we make Absolutely. breakthroughs and then we still fall. But I was thinking, I think one of the reasons that it works, at least in fiction, is because, you know, other things like the, the big world altering events are happening and they're solving those but the people, the individuals are still healing slowly over time. And so I think maybe yeah. that's... The people are still people. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately, you know, I think you're exactly right. We have our characters, they're interacting in whatever plot we've put them. Um, but, you know, if we're being good, I think about character development and really showing 
the way that characters both change and the lapses that they have and the regressions that they have, I think that that's really honest. It's the way life is. And whether you're looking at something very serious, like say alcoholism and the sort of cycles that you go through in that, or if you're just looking at, you know, something more simple like friendships, the ebb and flow of that, or, you know, the way that we kind of struggle through adolescence when we're trying to figure out who we are and what we want to be. I mean, it's all they're all cycles that we go through as human beings. And I think that that really does resonate, whether it irritates us or not, because I don't know about you, but when I regress back to something else that I already <laughs> learned, yes, I get really mad at myself about that. And so it's, it's okay Completely. to feel that towards the characters. Cause yeah, I mean, it's, that's normal too. So I have something that I hadn't thought of when we were planning this episode, but I was just thinking like, that is good. But on the other hand, sometimes you get I feel like sequels, especially of movies, run into this problem where it wasn't intended to have a sequel, but the movie did really well, so they make a second one. And instead of, like, making the characters continue to progress, they're like, we're just going to do the same character arc. So, like, they made this. Oh, yeah. and they so, so there's obviously some difference between, like, humans still developing and healing slowly and just, well, we're going to completely wipe the slate clean. Well, and I think that for writers, um, and this is certainly, I think, true in the crime fiction genre because there are a lot of series and a lot of character-based series, but sometimes, um, you know, when you pick up a book that's about a character that you like and you've been following for a long time and you start realizing that it's kind of the same book over and over and over again, right. um, <laughs> yes, you kind of have to think to yourself, um, you know, is this character changing or it really is? It, has it become sort of a plot-based series. It's really more about the actual story and the action that's going on and not as much about the character. We just happen to like the character. I run into that a lot, especially in detective stories mm. where, you know, we like the detective because he's rugged or he's this or he's that. And of course, none of them ever follow police protocol in any way. <laughs> and they're able to solve every crime perfectly in one little book length. And then the next, you know, story they come in and they're kind of in the same place and you're kind of like, okay, so cool, this is more about the actual story and what's happening there than it really is about this character anymore. And I feel comfortable with this character going into another book, but now it's not really about them anymore. It's about something else. Um, you know, I think some of that really comes down to what kind of a writer you are, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, for me, I'm all about the character growth and development. And when they get stuck and stagnant, it's frustrating for mm -hmm. me. It's frustrating for them because it's frustrating for me. And um, you know, I want to <laughs> try and figure out how to kind of work with that and frame it in such a way that it's not frustrating for the people who are listening or reading. Well, and how, how do you, I guess, how do you plot that? How do you plan that? Uh, is that something that you plot or plan or is, is it something that you deal with at the beginning of every book? Um, I am. I'm not a plotter. And so <laughs> That's right. We just said you were a painter. I <laughs> plan everything else. Yes. I go to conferences all the time where authors will say, oh, I have these in insane like hundred page plots where I, I know every single thing that's going to happen. And it just sounds so amazing. I wish I could be one of those people <laughs> because I go in and I'm like, I think this thing is going to happen in like 10 pages. And I'm like, well, maybe actually we'll do this. And then I'll hit a point and I'll be like, well, you know, actually the character really wouldn't do that thing that I thought I was going to put in there. So now it's something completely different. And I often find that by the time I get done with book, whatever book I'm working on that manuscript, I'm like, whenever I get done with that manuscript, I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it's going, but we're going to go ahead and just work on this. So and go with it. And I let the characters lead me and I let, you know, whatever is happening at that time kind of dominate. And so. So if, if you don't plot it, but still like you're clearly using your, the trauma as, as a device through the story. So how do you, how do you do that? How does it? I think I think a lot more about how trauma plays out. So this would probably be the one place where I am doing at least a little bit of planning in my head as I'm working along because I am thinking about the way that trauma plays out in a person's life. So um, and in a very kind of big picture way of looking at it. So uh, a child abuse victim might have these sorts of things happen to them when they're going to high school and then these sorts of things happen to them as a young adult. And then once they're in a relationship, these sorts of things might happen. And it's not super, super specific, but I have kind of an idea of how that arc might look. Um, and also how it looks if that person is able to overcome or work through their trauma in a way, or if they don't. 
um, because that is absolutely, you know, the, the other choice is if you can't figure out, then you get a lot of addiction and you get a lot of self-destructive behaviors because it's difficult dealing with trauma. And some people um, have a really hard time finding a way through that process. And those people are, you know, also human beings deserving of love and empathy and all of the things that I'm trying to get for everybody. So that's probably the most mindful thing that I'm doing when I'm writing. Everything else is like whatever I come up with at any <laughs> given time, but that part of it I usually have a pretty good so idea So for you, about. the trauma is the planning. Kind it of. kind of is, and I mean partially because I really do want that process to be very authentic, and so I do need it to... I need it to ring true, and I can't just decide that a character is going to act a certain way that's completely not in with whatever that thing is, that trauma is. I need them to behave as if that is a thing that actually did happen in their life. So I do kind of have to have an idea of how that plays out. And how do you research that? Like, what are what are the best ways to find that information? Like, is it is it all, like, groups online, or is it, like... Um, psychology books, books yeah. or is it? Is I studied it interview or I studied a lot when I was doing my um, graduate work. I studied a lot about violence and and behavior that sort of thing, um, just on a purely psychological basis. And then when I did some postgraduate work in forensic criminology, I was really looking at criminal behavior and victim behavior and how those things differ from what we might see in a normal sort of typical, neurotypical person, um, I would say. And so um, I do research in textbooks to learn about what are sort of the case studies for that particular type of behavior or mental illness. I read a lot of first person accounts. So I read a lot of memoirs. I live, read a lot of articles that are written by people who have experienced things that are similar. I draw from my own life. So things that I've experienced or have had people around me experience and I've seen kind of what happens to them. And then last but not least, I do rely on a pretty large base of maybe not beta readers, but sensitivity readers when I'm done mm -hmm. to see if I've kind of hit the mark. So I belong to the International Association of Forensic Nurses. And my last book I had, I think I sent out over 100 copies to members just to have them read and to give feedback and to tell me which parts seemed realistic and which parts seemed like they completely missed the boat. And then I made changes based on that. And I'll continue doing that because that's really, those are the people that are working, at least in terms of sexual assault, those are the people who are working on the ground every day with victims. And so they have a lot of really great perspective on what that looks like, what the process looks like, and, and how victims are different in the way that they react. We're getting ready to wrap up here, but I wanted to end on how should people take care of themselves when they're writing about mm. uh, trauma? Like, do you have suggestions for, like, for the author to protect themselves and then for the readers to protect themselves and stuff like that? Because, yeah, big advocate of, like, hey, guys, <laughs> please take care of yourselves. <laughs> yeah, so self-care is really huge. I think when you're working with victims of trauma, when you're talking about it, even when I was working on it in a very academic sense, it's like sometimes that stuff really gets to you. You'll read a story that maybe hits you a certain way. And, you know, we all experience, I think, everybody who's kind of dealing with trauma in their lives or are writing about it and working with it. I think that we all have to step back and figure out the places where our anxiety or depression are getting a little bit out of hand. We need to take breaks. We need to do the things that you do for self-care, like take walks, exercise, eat well, sleep well, do all the things that are going to help make you a healthy person. Because when you're dealing with things that are very hard emotionally, your body is going to react to Mm. And it's not just about, you know, mental depression or anxiety. It's about, you know, fatigue and getting sick and all of the things that can sort of be physical manifestations of the stress that you're taking on. So absolutely, whether you're writing about something that is your own trauma or you're writing about something that is just traumatic, um, it's a really good idea to practice good self-care. And there are lots of great resources out there um, for meditation and for mm -hmm. just ideas about how to keep yourself, your body, and your mind in check. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. This has been a really great discussion. Um, hopefully our listeners have learned something as well. And we like to leave off with a question for them. And so I was thinking, well, I guess, Miranda, did you have one? Did I have a question? If not, uh, I do, but. 
Oh, I was going to say, let's hear yours. Okay. And then we um, can do mine and then we can pick which one we like because <laughs> we have that power. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, um, assuming you're writing fiction, um, think about your main character and is there trauma that they have experienced? And if not, is there trauma that you could introduce into their lives to help them grow? That sounds terrible, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think that that's, that's mm-hmm. not terrible. I think that that's true. I mean, yeah. There, there is not usually growth without some sort of stimulus. Yeah. I mean, we don't say kill your dollar and darlings for nothing, right? Like, <laughs> there's a reason why we introduce that kind of stuff into our books, because it does help our characters grow and for us to show how they grow. And there are also levels of trauma. It doesn't yeah. have to automatically be at the max. And you could break your toe. It's trauma. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, at The Writing Forge. And check us out at our social links in the description. And we will catch you all next time. Stay sharp, my friends. Stay sharp. That's all the time we have for today, folks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Writing Forge, an NCW podcast brought to you by Nagano Press. To learn more about The Writing Forge and our parent company, Northern Colorado Writers, be sure to check out our website at northerncoloradowriters.com. Check out our social links in the description. You can subscribe to The Writing Forge wherever podcasts are aired. If you like this episode, you'd really help us out by rating and reviewing. If you're looking for more informational writing content, be sure to become an NCW member. Stay sharp, my friends.